We are witnessing a radical change in the 8,000 meter peaks of the world. The era of commercial guiding on all of them has opened the doors to very inexperienced people. We're only this week an unconfirmed yet impressive number of climbers summited K2 on very risky, snowy, avalanche-like conditions. Most of these people were guided or guides themselves, including Norwegian Kristin Harala and Tenjin Lama Sherpa, who have now climbed all 14 8,000 meter peaks in 92 days. Impressive and outrageously crazy accomplishment. And there was also, unfortunately, a confirmed death of Mohammed Hassan, a high altitude porter from Pakistan who was swept away in a slab avalanche below the bottleneck at about 8,200 meters. My guest today, Adrian Ballinger, knew early on that he was made for the mountains. He was at Georgetown University in his teens. He was mentored by a well-known climber who took him around the world, guiding, opening Adrian's eyes to what was out there and what could be. I'm gonna let Adrian tell you the story, but suffice it to say, he told his parents that he was taking a year off after Georgetown University before medical school to get the climbing out of his system, and the rest is history. In this interview about the making of a mountaineer, Adrian talks about working under the auspices of renowned climber and guide Russell Bryce, who has guided hundreds of people to the summit of Mount Everest, and himself among his many climbing feats became the first to climb the three pinnacles of the true northeast ridge of Mount Everest in 1988. The only time the three pinnacles have been repeated was in the 90s with the Japanese who essentially had a Sherpa team fix ropes and carry all the loads all along the entire route. This is my conversation with Adrian Ballinger. He's married to professional climber Emily Harrington. They have a little boy, less than a year old. In our interview, I learned that Adrian learned to ski a very short distance for where I myself learned to ski in Western Massachusetts. He has summited Everest and K2 without supplemental oxygen. He is a fully certified rock, alpine, and skiing guide. He's also the founder and CEO of Alpenglow Expeditions, and he's made at least 18 successful summits of 8,000 meter peaks. Crazy. Here we go with Adrian Ballinger. I begin by asking him where he's from. Here we go. It's a great interview on the making of a mountaineer. Yeah, so I was actually born in Cheltenham, England. My family's British. I lived there until I was six years old. And then my uh, dad was working for IBM at the time and got an early computing job in the US, like a two year contract. We moved to Massachusetts. The whole family thrived and uh, got green cards and stayed. No doubt. So uh, that is awesome. So yeah, Eastern Massachusetts. So you got some Boston in your blood then or like Boston, Worcester. And I was like skiing there. I lived walking distance from this little ski hill called Mount Massachusetts. So I was skiing. I had family friends who started taking me camping and rock climbing when I was like 12 years old. Then I went to school in Washington, D.C. I went to Georgetown and this well-known climber, Chris Warner, who owned the Earth Treks climbing gyms, he was overseeing an outdoor leadership program at Georgetown at the time. He was like a climbing bum that funded his expeditions with this like she-she job at a college. And uh, he took me under his wing and I started going internationally when I was 17, a freshman in college, started going to South America and then Nepal. And the second I graduated school, I started full-time traveling and guiding with him. That is exceptional. So you knew, man, you like you, was it like your uh, foot hit a rock or like when you your uh, first climb was like, uh, like did just, you, you know, I mean, I, I was always, I loved athletics and I was never really good enough to go pro in anything I did, whether it was tennis or basketball, or then it was rock climbing and mogul skiing. And I was good, but I was never good enough. And when I was 17 with Chris over Christmas break, my first school year at Georgetown, I, he invited me to go to Ecuador. And I, I went to Ecuador and I climbed Cotopaxi, Chimborazo and Cayambe. And it just clicked. It was like the hardest thing I had ever done mentally, physically, emotionally. And yet it also like I knew right away, like, oh, I'm I'm good at this. Like maybe I'm just I like suffering or maybe I have some genetic advantage at altitude. But right away, I knew there was something there. And so every school break, I started putting time in. 
But it still wasn't that straightforward a path, right? Like I graduated school, got myself into medical school and told my parents I was taking a year off before I went back to medical school to get climbing in out of my, out of my system. And yeah, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> oh my God. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you touched upon like such an, a, a, the real key of it is like, there's the suffering part, but somewhere deep inside, you're like, wow, this is really resonating with me in my soul level. Like it's something going on and that suffering actually feels good. And then, you know, so did you were, was there ever an epic early on where you're like, whoa, man, we just had a brush with death and I performed at a higher level than in a normal day kind of. Like, yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of small moments like that, right? Uh, in all of our climbing careers from the, the first time I got frostbite on an alpine style climb of a mountain called Chakra Rahu in Peru with Chris Warner, like a personal climb. We spent 24 hours on the face and I spent too many hours hanging in a harness and I ended up blackening two toes. Like when I think back, a lot of those moments I remember, they're actually the ones that kind of brought the seriousness home and began to like help me structure what my decision making and, and framework of going to the big mountains were. So, you know, getting frostbite when I was 20 years old in Peru. And then when I was 22, I was guiding what we back then we used to call a trek in Nepal, where we were, uh, you know, we went over the Amphu Lapcha Pass and we climbed Mara Peak and Island Peak. So kind of this like moderately technical you know, glaciated terrain, but we called them treks. And my co-guide, uh, Nima Sherpa, ended up getting killed crossing the Ampulapsha when he was unroped from a fixed rope and tripped. Like, Crampon actually caught the leg of a pant, this incredibly talented climber, and he fell 700 feet in front of me. And it was the first fatality I had in the mountains. And it was with my group. And it was a mistake that every sing any single one of us could have made, right? Like how many times have we quickly unclipped to get some work done faster because a storm is coming? And so like when I think of formative moments, it was those moments where it was like, one, the seriousness of it all came home. Two, I was forced to really look into like why I thought these experiences were worth it despite their risks and despite like, you know, he had a six year old son and he had a wife and I spent, you know, the next decade supporting that kid and, and that family the best I could, even though I was eating bean burritos and had no money. But like feeling that seriousness and being like, yep, I still love this. I still want to do this. And here's how I'm going to try to do it the best I can. Those are the moments I sort of remember that set me on this path. Wow. Uh, I did not know that story. That's, that's pretty moving. And I was young. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're, yeah, that, that really settles in deep in the soul. And, um, you know, that you, it, it's funny because it's not funny. Actually, it's impressive when you look at what your list of ascents are just in, in 8,000 meter peaks alone, you've crammed a lot into say, let's say the last 15 years or so, like yeah. uh, outrageous, kind of like the Sherpas are doing now, right? Like, you know, hitting, you know, three 8,000 meter peaks a season or doing Everest three times. Um, so you worked with Russell Bryce for a while and then we're in the TV production realm, if you will, yes. kind of getting on TV for on the Discovery series, which is pretty awesome. And um, so you you were just gobbling it up and I'm sure you were getting tapped by people like Russell, who was like, it, in my view, was like, it doesn't get any higher, like better than that guy, the godfather of it all in a way. <laughs> and I think like when I look back at my last couple of decades, um, you know, it, it really has been the fortune I've had with a series of mentors in my life. I, you know, I already mentioned when I was 12 years old, I had this family friend who got me started. And then when I was 17, I had Chris Warner. And then when I decided, you know, I started Alpenglow Expeditions in 2004, and by 2007, I had all these clients that I was guiding on six and 7,000 meter peaks, and they wanted to go to 8,000 meter peaks. And I was, you know, I'd like to believe humble enough to know I shouldn't take them alone. And so I approached Russell because just like you, I was like, he's the best. He's the best on the planet, right? There are other good operators, Mountain Madness or Adventure Consultants, but Russell is it. I knew that. And so I just, 
essentially cold called him and was like, I have clients. Here's my experience. I know I shouldn't do this alone. And so he let me bring my clients with him in 2007 to Cho OU. And that was the start of us realizing we actually had a really good partnership where he was the legend, but he wanted to be up high less. He wanted to be doing the logistics and the huge film projects. And he was this incredibly talented, like, dictatorial mastermind of big expeditions and i was like this 20 something year old kid that wanted to be climbing with the ship uh, and spending as much time in my crampons up high as i could and just sucking it all in and i had a lot of energy which i think russell appreciated like i could be all day with my clients being social and charismatic and having fun and never kind of tire of that that was the point in my career I was in. Yeah. And so we just clicked. And so from 2007 to 2012, I just guided every single trip with Russell, becoming sort of lead climbing guide and then co-leader and things like that. And, uh, you know, that's why in so many ways I had so many opportunities to do cool things in the mountains because I had this great support network. I was learning from the best. Eventually it was time I wanted to continue. I would say, you know, trying my own style, whether it was smaller teams or pre-acclimatization and faster trips, or I wanted to be able to do things like climb without oxygen or have a client climb without oxygen. And Russ had a system and it was the best system on the mountain and he wasn't ready to keep changing things at a certain point. And that is why eventually it was time for me to go out on my own. Right on. So that's a perfect jumping off point. So tell me a little bit about Alpenglow, that idea of oxygenless ascents, and then also enter into that, that the speed ascent, which you've really revolutionized. You jumped out, you've got some great, oh, without bottled oxygen ascents under your belt. You got K2, Everest. Uh, I don't know. Were you on Gashabram? Uh, no, just Everest and K2 without yeah. supplemental oxygen. Uh, because the reality is still a vast majority of my time in the big mountains has been guiding and expedition leading. It's a, such a passion of mine to try to bring other people to these sort of peak performance places and experiences. And while some might disagree with me, I feel very strongly that if I'm in a guiding role, I must be on oxygen. I just Completely know agree. how my brain works on oxygen and without, despite being genetically lucky and talented at altitude and uh, you know i've only gotten i've only learned to feel stronger in that in my mountain climbing but also i'm a pilot for the last six years i've been flying small planes as sort of a, a hobby and a passion that's outside of my professional work of climbing and skiing and you know the the data is just so clear above twelve thousand feet pilots are required to wear oxygen if they're above twelve thousand feet for more than 30 minutes and the reason is there is just reams of data from military pilots that have been studied, the decision-making falls apart at high altitudes. And of course, they're not acclimatized, the pilots, and we are acclimatized. But to claim that you can be at 26,000 feet not on oxygen and have 100% of your decision-making capacity just is not true. Yeah. And so that was my soapbox of one of the things I see in the industry right now of, you know, Anatoly Bukharev used to do it in the 90s and he was an outlier. And now somehow it seems to be coming back, guiding and expedition leading, not on oxygen. And I just I just think it's wrong. So uh, anyway, so my, my no oxygen climbing has actually been quite limited, uh, you know, and it kind of started that sometimes when I was climbing with the Sherpa teams, either rope fixing or load carrying, Earlier on in the seasons before I was working with clients with Russell, he would he would encourage me to climb with the Sherpa without oxygen. So I did things like go to the South Pole without oxygen with Sherpa. And so I was learning of my sort of like capabilities in that space. Um, and I got to the point where I knew on oxygen that I had the capacity to summit, for instance, Mount Everest, the high mountains. And that's why I was guiding and, and doing those types of things. And the thing that brought me to the big mountains when I was a teenager was reading all the books of like the unknowns that the early climbers were facing. And I did eventually want to get 
I wanted to find that line for myself, you know, to go into a climb, having no idea if I could succeed or fail and having to make those impossible decisions up high in that mind frame. And so those were personal climbs that I tried Everest and K2 without supplemental oxygen. I also last year tried Makalu without supplemental oxygen while skiing and ultimately decided I wasn't strong enough to both with the conditions. And so I put oxygen on. Um, so I failed without oxygen plenty of times as well as those successes we mentioned. I have one more small segment that I'll be sharing with you soon with Adrian. He talks about being a parent and guiding and climbing in the mountains and taking risks and the differences between how men and women are viewed in the world of mountaineering and skiing on big mountains such as Makalu and Monoslu. As I mentioned in the earlier part of this video, he is married to Emily Harrington, who is no stranger to critiques who wish to comment on what a woman or man for that matter should or should not be doing once they become a parent. I hope you've enjoyed what I've showed you today. Take care of yourselves, take care of the people you love, do a good deed, don't look for anything in return, make the world a better place. Peace out my friends, have a killer day.